characterize the way they make their armor, which is they weave all their armor out of wicker. And then I added that to the Aztecs, who have no metal technology, but they have massive amounts of gold and turquoise. And to that I've added ivory, because let's face it, they've got giant elephants. So what we end up with the Haradrim was a culture that I think is far more unique and far less recognizable. These wicker-made suits of armor, reinforced with shaped bamboo, elements of the Aztec culture being woven into it through semi-precious stones, selective pieces of gold plating. We also gave them animal fetishes, like they bring the power of the beast onto themselves by adorning themselves in beast uh, tokens. Their technology is very much one from fighting from the back of a large creature, as, say, the way that real elephants are used in our world. They mostly use spears and bows, uh, bows that are built out of long antlers, very strong poundage on the bows to fire short little bamboo arrows from these bamboo quivers down into the enemy. So once again, the gold motif with little tiny Aztec illustrations of characters in battle running around the bottom of them. Also, uh, you see some Haradrim who are driving the elephants, and we thought we'd have a bit of fun with these guys. So we went to town with them with um, body painting, scarification, tattooing. The joy of something like this is that you actually make this whole scenario of how they make their stuff. You know, you don't just go on the Haradrim, you go. The way to make them special and fantastic is to actually come up with an entire culture to back up any questions about them. <laughs> of the orcs it was an interesting journey with these characters because in film one and film two we played them as much more of a sort of a rabble this sort of schoolyard bully the rats of the battlefield they have clad themselves in armor that they've scrounged and picked up off the corpses of their enemies and patched these together with bits of fabric and finery but it's all rotted away and dirtied down the orcs were one of the big problems of Return of the King, partly because we created a reasonably formidable force of opposition for the Helm's Deep sequence. And the Irukai, by their nature, were much tougher and stronger and more brutal, and they worked quite well. And the very first cut that we ever saw of Return of the King, it was one of the weakest things in the movie with the orcs. I just think the ape-like thing looks... Just, I, I just don't like, don't like the look of it. It looks just a little... It looks a little like people are trying too hard to look, to look like apes. They'd unfortunately been trained, the extras and stunt people have been trained to walk in this bow-legged monkey walk, which I called the full diaper walk because it looked like, but they just looked like kids with full diapers basically, the way that they were trotting around and they were anything but scary. So he came to us and said, look, I realise now that for the final battles, the orcs now need to take on a more intimidating, and focused perspective. In fact, we even need characters within the armies of the orcs that become the antagonists that I can focus on and separate out from the masses. The brief on the new orcs was kind of uh, uber orcs. These were actually Sauron's orcs. It was really the idea of they're not a new breed, they're not Urukai, but they are the best orcs. And they've lived and been trained in Mordor as an army. So we went back to the drawing board, and basically what we did is we had literally hundreds and hundreds of photos and drawings of all of the orc makeups that we did, and he wanted to see them all. So what we did is we got them all, stuck them on this huge, huge board, and we put numbers by them all. And you could just go on and go, oh, I'll have a bit of that, and a bit of that, and that's really cool. And that's not physically possible, sorry. But maybe if we change that a bit, then you could actually cobble together other people's cool ideas. That's our favourite one there. The orcs are all going to have individualised helmets and armour, and their faces are all different. He'd uh, check each ones that, that he really, really liked. And then from there, he says, um, yeah, this is what I don't want. He says, I don't want any witchy poo noses. So witchy poo noses was the thing. I guess it was sort of a, a long, extended nose. So we sort of went for something a bit more skeletal on the new breed of mortal orcs. Their faces, they were supposed to be just really, really hard. They were supposed to feel a little more lived in, kind of diseased. I mean, they are a lot stronger, but they've just been corrupted by this malice for so long. They have just little bits of rot and stuff all over them. Their new looks, we also gave them an upgrade with armor, you know, armor design as well. So the guys at the workshop designed all this new, really kind of cool armor. 
the whole idea is plate steel, but it's all the curves are should be sharpened and filed, so they're all like shears and secateurs, and if you get near to this armor, it'd be enough to lose fingers. Oh, like it. I think it helped to actually make them into more credible and fierce and fighting groups. Another big failing with the orcs was that they had no commander. We had Sauron in his tower and we had the Witch King, but we had nobody on the battlefield sort of telling the orcs what to do. And so we created a character who was only referenced by name once or twice in the book, and that's the character of Gothmog, played by Lawrence McCory. First question was, what is a Gothmog? Well, it's, oh, oh, no one's told you yet? No. Uh, he's actually an orc. I want an orc. In, in the first movie, I played an Urukai. They stand tall. Orcs were the little ones. I mean, how am I going to play an orc when I'm six foot four? We picked Lawrence because he had played Lurtz in the Fellowship of the Ring, and he'd done such a great job about projecting all this energy and aggression through this thick rubber prosthetics we had to wear. Oh, no, that we couldn't think of anybody better. We yeah, thought, well, the great thing with prosthetics is you can design a completely different face and still stick it on the same guy, and you're never going to recognise him. Phil had beautifully sculpted goth mob, and I put uh, just a, a spot of, of rot on the side of his nose, uh, in addition to some of the, the callous stuff that we were doing on some of the others. And I was afraid that the rot was going to be a bit much. I looked at that and I thought, God, we should use this, but go way, way beyond this. In fact, we should do a John Merrick. And he basically says, you know, a bit more like the Elephant Man. It's like, well, so like take it in, you know, you know, a bit more in here, and you know, he grabs like a big chunk of plastic and he starts packing it on. It's like, okay. We always like to think these days that we can preempt Pete's excesses to a certain degree, but sure enough, when Pete comes in for his design meetings, he's there with the big chunks of plastic and mushing it on and pushing it around and heat gun and squashing it. He goes off to a meeting with Richard uh, just after that, and like 10 minutes later, I take an entire block of plastic and just crumpled up into balls and just pack it onto the side of this thing. It's like, okay, I just want, I want to get to a point where he's going to say, all right, that's too far, now pull it back. And the uh, next time you saw it, he said, yeah, that's great. <laughs> okay, well, we'll put texture over the top and call it done. You get an early morning call, and you're still tired from, you know, waking up so early, and then you sort of, like, fall asleep. It's like, there. He'd sleep down the chair, and he'd have hours of makeup done. He always seemed to be suffering from lack of sleep because he had to arrive on set at four in the morning. And then sit inside all this latex. I've got this great photo of him sound asleep in a wheelbarrow, you know, all hanging over the edges of this wheelbarrow off, tucked in behind his shed. And when it was time for him to do his thing, we either wake him up or drag him out of the breakfast tent or wherever he'd wandered off to. That way? <laughs> Which way? <laughs> And send them off in the often you wouldn't undress them again until the end of the day. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, it's really great. In the film, he comes riding in on his, uh, on his, on his, uh, on his ward. Just looks like a John Wayne kind of character on his, comes riding in on his horse. He's just turned out to be a really cool character, and uh, he's featured in the film quite a bit. What of the wizard? I will break him. Another decision we made was to redesign the Witch King. Which, which, when I say redesign the Witch King, was really his helmet. John Howe was a big influence on the original helmet design. I did a lot of drawings and sculptures based off the helmets you see in his paintings, which are his very tall bucket, sort of round helmets with the crown.